this is American political thought. Um, this was to be the, and it is the third module in um, our consideration of the readings in Democracy in America for April 12th through 16th last week, um, included in this original model and then a module or, or class lecture, um, I, I was going to combine the two considerations of the future of American and global democracy, which is really the whole thrust of um, de Tocqueville's uh, project uh, in the last couple of chapters of Volume 1, Part 2, but particularly as his analysis of the Moors, the customs of Americans, uh, moves towards its conclusion in Volume 2, and especially in Part 4, where he really does gaze his prophetic, prophetic uh, vision in the future. Uh, I decided, and then the second part of this lecture slash module was to be our discussion of uh, race, systemic racism in, in America, and and uh, and to go back to Volume One, Part One, Chapter uh, Volume One, Part Two, Chapter Ten, the three races that inhabit America, and then discuss the storing article on the conflict between Booker T. Washington and um, uh, W. B. Du Bois, um, and uh, but I've decided actually to um, to have this module simply um, finish the discussion of the future of democracy. And then I'm going to do a separate lecture on race and racism and systemic racism and have that be the transition point between Tocqueville and the rest of the class and our last four authors who are, and of course, uh, Thomas Sowell, uh, Discrimination and Disparities, um, and uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, Robin D'Angelo, and Shelby Steele, and but uh, since I've I've really thought through that material, uh, and and have I think some broader uh, um, observations to make, and also to connect it to several of the uh, current issues in our public life today, um, I'm going to actually do a separate lecture on that. So this lecture um, will conclude the issue of the future of democracy, which I began in the second module of this material, and um, and we'll finish it today. So, in my previous lecture, I had gotten as far as, in the notes, Roman numeral 1, A, and B. And remember, to kind of uh, bring you up to speed, or to remind you, I said that de Tocqueville's prediction about the future of democracy in America, and in the globe for that matter, was a combination or a uh, of four different chunks of analysis or different different uh, aspects of his grasp of the democratic character and democratic society. Um, if you remember, one was the relationship between equality and freedom or liberty. And the um, uh, second one was um, the, uh, the growth of individualism, which we talked about. And then the third was the unfolding of modernity. And the fourth one was um, the tendency towards centralization. And so we're, we'll deal with the last two in this lecture. And and by the unfolding of modernity, uh, I, I mean some things that are very explicitly and commonly developed throughout the democracy democracy in America, but also some of the larger, larger uh, observations that de Tocqueville makes about the state of modern human beings. And de Tocqueville was a student of philosophy, again, to remind you, when he was talking about the American mind and American intellect in uh, volume two, part one, the, the thoughts of Americans, he and and chapter one starts out with the, the uh, poignant almost observation that Americans are the most Cartesian people who've never read Descartes, um, and um, and uh, and de Tocqueville showed a, a fairly depth deft discussion of Hobbes and Locke and the other Enlightenment philosophers, especially Cartesian method, and so um, he was aware that a. a and, and and let me just say that I think that his understanding that we're in a historical turning point for humanity, where the aristocratic past is giving way to the um, uh, a democratic future, and that two nations in his time, uh, to be three and possibly four, that is to say, the two nations, uh, America and France, whose revolutions shook the world in 1776 and 1789, respectively, showed two poles of democracy a liberal, law-abiding um, 
one reconciled with personal responsibility and liberty and community, and another radicalized version, which was based upon a resentment and, and envy and a hatred of inequalities, which would then turn to radical. So de Tocqueville, who, again, was born in 1805 and came to this country in 1831 and then, and then died relatively young in his 50s, uh, went on to have write a couple of other important books, um, including, by the way, uh, which I mentioned in some previous lectures, L'Ancien Régime et la Révolution Française, um, the old regime and the French Revolution, in which his thesis, and this becomes, let, let me actually develop this a bit because this becomes important to his subsequent prediction of democracy in America in the future. Um, his point in the old regime and the French Revolution was, why was it that the new regime in the French Revolution became so radicalized and so powerful and capable of extending a, a radical and murderous ex, uh, influence over all of society? It's because the old regime, the uh, Bourbon king, had become, have developed a kind of a centralized bureaucratic police state. And it's true that probably in the west of Europe, um, there were two nations that developed uh, in Europe uh, in the uh, late 1700s and the early 1800s, something like a police state that became the, the template of all modern authoritarian and totalitarian states, uh, echoing aspects of it in Bismarck's Germany, in the Sec Third Reich, in the Soviet Union, in the People's Republic of China, and almost every other Marxist regime, um, where uh, the old regime had built up the apparatus of bureaucratic centralization and total control of society. So when the new regime came about through the French Revolution and, and, and possessed this radical envy-oriented egalitarian version of democracy, all it had to do literally was chop off the head of the old regime and replace it with the radical head <coughs> of the new regime. And de Tocqueville saw that in France, and that's why, for your information, at the end of volume one, uh, when he uh, on the uh, he gazes, he directs his gaze towards the future uh, and sees a time when Russia and America will control the world, one through freedom and one through slavery, which of course described in some ways perfectly the the dynamics of the Cold War, in somewhat simple terms. But but he he pretty much got the dynamics of these two great countries and that they would split the world up between them. Um, it's because he took the analysis in the old regime in the French Revolution and applied it to the other nation that had built up the extensive totalitarian police state. And that was the Tsarist regime. So in a way, de Tocqueville was predicting that America and Russia would split up the world in the future, not just because Russia was a vast country, and at that time, Britain was, of course, the British Empire was the most powerful um, empire in the world. Um, but So it wasn't just that Russia was a vast and un- uh, exploited continent and resources in extent comparable to the North American continent, although there was that element. But he predicted that the radical authority of the Tsarist regime would be overthrown by, and by the way, the Bourbon regime also uh, had in common with the Tsarist regime, um, a, a radical aristocracy. Uh, probably the most, the two nations that had the most uh, powerful differences between the tiny aristocratic uh, ruling class and the mass of of impoverished serfs and peasants, so so de Tocqueville saw in in the coming ages a parallel uh, that he was he would he predicted there would come a Russian revolution that would look and behave very much like the French Revolution, and he was absolutely right about that. And so, um, but it wasn't. But again, the reason he was interested in this wasn't just because. Um, uh, there would be a, a future Russia that would look like the past and present, now somewhat past in his time even, because the, Napoleon, of course, had ridden as, risen as the dictator, an emperor of, of the post-revolutionary France, and he had been deposed, and France had returned to something like Republican normality, and, you know, uh, essentially the same kind of republic that it is today. Um but uh, but he also understood in these two ver versions, Russia and America, Russia slash France in his time, Russia slash America. I'm sorry, uh, the U.S. Uh, revolution, the, the American Revolution for the French Revolution in his time, and then the Russian Revolution in the in the coming time, the coming centuries. He understood that those two versions of democracy were the two poles that democracy moved between.
And as you're going to see, he, his prediction is, is that even America, which was based on one poll, the decent poll of democracy, would eventually um, uh, collapse into and, and decay into, collapse and decay into the more radicalized uh, and authoritarian centralized welfare state. Um, and, by the way, had de Tocqueville known more about the world at that time, um, and and had he uh, had his predictive glasses on even more, he would not be surprised by the collapse of the Soviet Union in seventeen. Uh, I'm sorry, 1989, uh, 1990. And of course, the place in the bipolar universe in terms of the duality of <clears throat> democracy and the geopolitical strategy of the Americans versus somebody else, to Tokyo would not be surprised at all, although he didn't see it coming in his time, that Russia would be displaced by a new China because all of the dynamics that he saw coming, that he saw in revolutionary France, and that he predicted coming in revolutionary Russia, the Soviet Union, he also could have predicted had he brought his 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 uh, spectrum more uh, into the Far East and understood that what happened in 1949 with the... And by the way, you'd have to say, uh, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution in 1917, and the Chinese Revolution in... 1949. Actually, all three of those all revolutions had the same stages. Uh, after the Bourbon, after the 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 uh, attack on the Be on uh, on um, um, the um, Bastille in on uh, July 14th, 1789, the beginning of the French Revolution, France went through a period of attempted liberal democracy uh, with a national assembly and a, uh, a, a kind of attempting a constitutional republic, as did the Russians, by the way, because the revolution in March in 1917 was the Menshevik Revolution, uh, uh, and, and that was the Republican Revolution. Well, the Chinese example is a little bit different. The Chinese revolution that displaced the old empire and aristocracy was the, uh, was the one led by Sun Yat-sen in 1911, which then tried to set up China as a liberal democracy, just as France had done and Russia had done, and um, and and again as China did. The difference is is uh, the transition from liberal democracy to radicalized uh, uh, authoritarianism or totalitarianism happened very rapidly in France, very rapidly in Russia in 1917 between March and October. The October Revolution, of course, brought the Bolsheviks into power and established the Soviet Union. In, in Chinese, in China, it took a little, the Republic of China took a little bit longer to collapse into um, the People's Republic of China in the, the Communist Revolution of 1949, because in some ways, the, the world history, because the invasion of Japan, uh, Japan's imperial ambitions um, became the dominant theme and kind of is partially what led to the destabilization of China in the 1930s and, of course, to the terrible genocide in Nanking, which some of you probably might know about, in which the Japanese um, manufactured a, a kind of a, an East Asian version of the Holocaust and, and, and committed a mass murder in um, Nanking in 1937 to 38, 39, that, by the way, is chronicled in a in a gripping and horrific book, *The Rape of Nanking* by Helen Chung, who uh, uh, chronicled that, and then of course committed suicide because the material was so depressing. And I recommend that book. And Dr. Dunn, I believe, has used that book before in his genocide class. So um, anyway, um, so uh, you could say that also the fact that it took a while for the radical Maoist elements, the, chi the communist elements, to find a political base, and then, of course, in some ways, the opportunistic opening to communist and radical revolution was uh, the dislocation by the invasion of, of Japan. And, uh, and then, of course, once the war was over, then uh, the Soviet Union came to the assistance of, of Mao Zedong, and, um, and the Chinese revolution occurred in 1949. But exactly the same dynamics happened in China, where uh, the revolutionary government immediately engaged in genocide and mass murder. For instance, in 1952 and then repeated in 1953 were called the three um, 
antes in 1952 and the five antes in 1953. Uh, the three antes, let's see, I can't remember. There was anti-imperialism, anti-individualism, anti-liberalism or something like that. And then the five antes, which was a radical um, uh, equalization, egalitarian and, and democratic, democratic restructuring of society, which involved mass murder, just like the French Revolution, the guillotine and the Russian Revolution. Um, uh, in which uh, the five antis were the campaign against anti-imperialism, anti-individualism, anti-bourgeoisism, anti-capitalism, and anti-whatever. And it's estimated, for instance, that the Chinese, Chinese uh, the People's Republic was busy killing 500,000 people a month in 1952, 53, etc. Um, and then, of course, in the, the Great Leap Forward, um, um, Mao achieved the deaths of, of dozens, I, I should say decades of millions of Chinese uh, like Stalin did in the 1930s, using starvation as a weapon, although it may have been somewhat unintentional in the Great Leap Forward in the late 50s in the People's Republic of China. But then the Cultural Revolution occurred in the mid-60s and late 60s, um, in which uh, uh, the Maoist and communist and radical elements uh, took over the country under Mao, who felt that his grip on China was fading, and therefore he thought the way to strengthen that grip was to um, uh, reawaken the revolutionary and radical fervor of the revolution and to keep the revolution going. Millions, of course, of people lost their lives then. Now, again, de Tocqueville would have seen those tendencies in that regime had he been able to see the political predecessors or precursors of it um, earlier in the century. And he would therefore, I think, easily find that his prediction that the world would be split up between the Soviet Union and the United States, or Russia and the United States, was very easily con uh, continued and that he would not be surprised that in the 21st century, it's a bipolar world in which competition between the People's Republic and the United States of America, which is shaping up as two different versions of democracy. And if you look at his dis description of the of the Russian tyranny at the and his prediction at the end of volume one, part two, it, his conclusion, it would it, you could take out Russia and put everything in because in some ways, the reason Russia faded was because it also it lost economic pro, pro, because uh, it lost its economic base because it never really developed, of course, uh, uh, because it rejected capitalism and embraced socialism. Um, the People's Republic, on the other hand, in uh, under um, uh, Deng Xiaoping, um, understood that um, that uh, communism and socialism were economically unproductive and embraced the free market but with a totalitarian and radical egalitarian party structure. So um, in, in some ways, the Chinese were wiser and, and more fortunate, perhaps, because they were managed to embrace the uh, advantages of capitalism and the free market. And by the way, we must give them credit. In one generation, they lifted the vast bulk of their uh, population uh, because prior to 1980, before the embrace of the free market, ironically, Nine tenths of their population were lived in real radical poverty, and today, that's been reduced to ten percent. Now that's ten percent of a billion people, um, but still, the the lifting up of the standard of living of the Chinese masses is one of the great human accomplishments of the twentieth century, and you must give the Chinese regime credit for that. Having said that, of course, they continue to strengthen the central authority, and so what you get in the People's Republic is exactly what de Tocqueville predicted. Uh, and so the coming century will be a contest between two different versions of democracy. The liberal, individual-oriented rule of law, communi uh, in some ways community participata participatory, and decentralized American Republic versus the totalitarian, authoritarian, uh, and, and brutal uh, uh, People's Republic, which clearly understands itself, by the way, to be an alternative model for the world's future. It clearly intends to, uh, to quote Khrushchev uh, in 1957 when he turned to the capitalistic and free nations of the world and said, we will bury you. He didn't mean that we're going to come over with Soviet troops and conquer you. His prediction was the productivity of, commun of a communist economy would outstrip the Western economy. Well, the Chinese knew that was baloney and, uh, and abandoned, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, a fully communist or socialist economy because they knew that would condemn them to economic irrelevance. Uh, so, uh, uh, having said that, they, the Chinese regime uh, 
completely centralizes all political authority in China. And, of course, people ha has e e erected the world's most effective su surveillance state using the same kind of technology that you and I use on the Internet and social media and everything like that. So, in some ways, um, uh, to go back then to, to Tocqueville's predictive future, you'll see some of this unfold in the rest of this lecture. Um, um, de Tocqueville thought, let, let's go back then and see the uh, the last two chunks of his prediction, which is the unfolding modernity. So let me explain what that means. And we'll start with the taste for physical comfort and material well-being in chapter 10 of volume 2, part 3, um, which had started out with the, um, uh, it, volume 3, uh, uh, volume 2, part 3 is the discussion of Moors and everything like that, the customs of America. After discussing the thoughts in part one, <clears throat> the feelings in part two, and emotions, and then, and so, what the Tocqueville saw was that as Cartesian science transformed the human condition, where prior to the modern world and modern political philosophy, and as Cropsey points out, uh, if you remember at the beginning of this class, and uh, prior to the spread of modern science as the kind of science which practically masters the laws of nature and subdues nature to our purposes. The idea that the mass that the masses could live in comfort was a utopian idea, um, uh, and but de Tocqueville understood that as science spread and as the productive dimensions of modern economy is spread, you would create that <clears throat> comfortable poor that we discussed in Volume One, Part Two, Chapter Five, when he has that class analysis, and that what America created and it means modern democracy. And if you look to Western Europe today. The same thing is true. The masses in America and Europe do are not don't live in relative poverty, absolute poverty. Yes, there are poor and rich in America, just there are in Europe. But the masses, the majority, have now attained a level of scientifically guaranteed physical comfort, including, by the way, the Tocqueville doesn't talk about health care, the transition in medical science to, to where the medical establishment actually really can cure people. And, and when combined with the rate of scientific increase, the, the point is society and government and humanity can deliver um, a, a level of physical security and comfort, which was unknown. And you'll see in this, um, uh, in chapter 10, the taste for physical comfort. When you actually make it possible for the mass, for the majority, the masses of, of humanity in a country, in the world perhaps, to live in physical country, they will become addicted to physical pleasures and comforts. And that's part of, so part of the unfolding of modernity is the conquest of nature and through the industrial revolution the tr and, and through the, all the other kinds of technological revolutions that we've had. Um, eventually, humankind will come to expect, and perhaps the pandemic or natural disasters kind of shake our confidence in our ability to rule nature and produce produce a scientifically secure, comfortable world. But our instincts now are shaped by that expectation. And so um, part of this uh, and the unfolding modernity then is the unfolding of that um, uh, uh, power to create a materially abundant universe. Marxism partially rests upon that. Marx thought that the communalization of the globe and of the human race would come from the internal contradictions of capitalism as he understood them, but also because capitalism would develop the productive technological industrial capabilities of humanity to create a superabundance that was previously unknown. That's why both Marx, uh, you've all heard the phrase Marx says that oh, religion is the opium of the masses. Well, again, there's a certain sense in which prior to the rise of modern science would create um, a comfortable and secure u material utopia in this life well, Marx suggests, and there may be something to this, all, all impoverished peasants who look forward to a life of oppression and poverty, real poverty, uh, could expect was uh, to go to heaven if they wanted to have a nice life. Marx says, and in some ways this is the expectation of modernity, even American modernity, is that as science unfolds and conquers nature and the abundance of the human project becomes available to everybody, and we'll see this is this will be part of the combination to centralization because not only will the masses of middle class people become attached to physical comfort and will want it secured not through the unpredictability and inequality of free markets that actually generated the poverty but they will want it provided and administered 
to them as clients or customers from a stable, centralized democratic authority. That, as you're going to see, will be the last chunk, this, the movement towards a modern democracy towards centralization because of uh, the unleashed taste for physical comfort, security. And when that's combined with egalitarianism, you'll get the authoritarian, centralized, and despotic welfare state. Uh, so, um, all right. So, <clears throat> um, there are a couple of things in part three. Uh, uh, and, and what I'll concentrate on first in chapter 10 is this taste for physical comfort and for, for secure physical comfort, material well-being. Um, again, as I mentioned several times in like in volume one, part two, chapter nine, that's where he predicts that religion will eventually evaporate from the masses, as it has in, happened in Europe, by the way. Um, Europe was a Europe is a post-Christian society, which is to say that in terms of organized Christianity as a cultural influence, it's all but evaporated or collapsed. There are still uh, cathedrals uh, and churches uh, in Europe and in England and other parts of the country, but the 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 part of the population that actually regularly turns to those institutions for cultural reinforcement of their uh, uh, personal lives and everything is, is, is relatively gone. People will go to church to get married, if that, uh, or, or to get christened, or funerals. But beyond that, uh, America has remained as the most religious country, which Tocqueville, if you remember, was part of his analysis and predicted. But de Tocqueville also thought that even religion would fade, and that seems to be happening much more rapidly in the last couple of decades than we ever thought. The Pew Center regularly takes polls and uh, about how religious people are and, and, and how often they go to church. And in the last 20 to 30 years, that's dropped, especially among younger people. So religion is fading in America. And, and so that's part of this progress of modernity. Um, and as you're going to see, there are several elements of that. But let me uh, open up with... Um, Chapter 10, and we'll start on 530, 531 for some passages. In America, the taste for physical well-being is not always exclusive, but is general. And though all do not feel it in the same manner, yet it is felt by all. Everyone is preoccupied caring for the slightest needs of the body and the trivial conveniences of life. <coughs> Something of the same is more or less conspicuous in Europe. And, of course, he would have, I think, predicted. Yes, there were a few world wars, uh, World War One and World War Two, And, yes, there was the rise of Nazism. But once Nazism was swept away and communism was defeated, Europe became a middle-class democracy. Um, and so almost all the same generalizations that Tocqueville makes about American democracy, you can make about a European democracy and the future democracy in the globe. Um, so um, look on page 531. In nations where an aristocracy dominates society, the people finally get used to their poverty, just as the rich do to their opulence. The latter are not preoccupied with physical comfort, enjoying it without trouble. They take it for granted, aristocratic uh, classes. The former, the peasants, the poor, do not think about it at all because they despair of getting it, because they do not know enough about it to not to, to want it. So his point is not that peasants... Uh, or, or serfs may resent their poverty, but they think it's uh, unchangeable. Go back to um, Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 3, uh, The Social State of the Americans, in which he discusses primogeniture. Remember, the key to all of this isn't just the development of the free market economy and capitalism and blah, 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 that stuff. It's the change in the nature of personal property. And once you broke up estates, you destroyed the whole economic and social basis of aristocracy and royalty, and you created a middle-class democracy where everybody is always striving to get more and to avoid having less. That's So that's the key, and it comes back to here, he adds some social analysis to it. In societies of that sort, the poor are driven to a mill. To dri here, here, this little Marxist thought, this is Tocqueville's version of Marx. Religion is the opium of the masses on page 531. In societies of that sort, permanent aristocracy societies, the poor are driven to dwell in imagination on the next world. It is closed in by the wretchedness of the actual world, but escapes therein and seeks for joys beyond. But when distinctions of rank are blurred and privileges abolished, when patrimonies are divided up, the abolition of primogeniture, and education and freedom spread, the poor conceive an eager desire to acquire comfort. Again, 
go back to the middle part of volume one part two chapter five this class analysis the majority of society is still poor according to that framework because they have to work for a living but once they taste the comfort that the 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 tiny middle class and aristocrat and upper classes and aristocratic society taste then they uh, that possibility of rising and falling will unleash a, a gentle and trivial materialism which will dominate their lives and all you have to do is look at american television uh go to the shopping neckers look at commercials um when we're not watching our sitcoms and our melodramas uh where we are positioned in front of our television sets and computers being seduced into purchasing thing even more things even more things which is one of the reasons that Europeans have always hated America, not only our prosperity, but our materialism. And here, Tocqueville is partially explaining it again. Um, a lot of middling fortunes are established. Their owners have enough physical enjoyments to get a taste for them, but not enough to content them or to be secure in them. I just added that. Uh, they never win them without effort and indulge in them without anxiety. They are therefore continually engaged in pursuing or striving to retain these precious, incomplete, and fugitive delights. And they will send their children to small, liberal, private arts, women's, and even co-ed colleges and universities, so to learn the skills so as to retain their, their upper-class mobility. Um, they are... Um, um, if one tries to think what passion is most natural to men, both stimulated and hemmed in by the obscurity of their birth and the mediocrity of their fortunes, nothing seems to suit them better than the taste for comfort. The passion for physical comfort is essentially a middle-class affair. It grows and spreads with that class and becomes preponderant with it. Therefore, uh, um, it, grow, uh, it, it works upward into the higher ranks of society and then spreads downwards to the people. And on, uh, on the bottom of that page, in America, I never met a citizen too poor to cast a glance of hope and envy towards the pleasures of the rich or whose imagination did not match in anticipation good things that fate obstinately refused to him. And and so de Tocqueville suggests as as modern life unfolds, the masses will become accustomed to addicted to uh, and and expecting uh, a life of permanently guaranteed physical comfort and material security. Um, and uh, and let's add a, a, a second element, which I put in the notes. Um, the mildness, simplicity, humaneness, homogeneity. Uh, look at page 615 of Democratic Moors. Um, the, um, and I want to read this beautiful quote uh, 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 in a minute. Um, um, of Madame de Sévigné uh, as an example of, of Moore's and the picture of humanity. To talk this point here, by the way, um, um, uh, is, um, here, let me read the passage from 615. This is, by the way, chapter 17. I don't think I assigned this chapter, but but I'm directing you to the passage. Um in aristocratic nations, money is the key to satisfaction of but few of the vast array of possible desires. In democracies, it is the key to them all. So that one usually finds love of money is either the chief or a secondary motive at the bottom of everything that Americans do. This gives a family likeness to all their passions and soon makes them wearisome to contemplate. The constant recurrence of the same passion is monotonous. Um, so too are the details of the methods used to satisfy it. You could say this. Um, there are possibly such things as people who come as tourists to Spartanburg, South Carolina, or Charlotte, North Carolina, or Cleveland, Ohio, or uh, Rock Island, Illinois, or Salt Lake City. Actually, that's because of the site of the Mormon miracle. There are kinds of tourists there. You can imagine people... And probably you've imagined yourself being a tourist in London or Paris or Berlin or um, Roma or even Moscow. But that's because those places have interesting history and an aristocratic past. If you're a tourist, why would you come to America to visit the Walmart in Spartanburg versus the Walmart in Charlotte? When he says that America 
a, acquires a kind of a homogeneity, setting aside all the ethnic contentions that have been awakened in the last couple of generations, um, <coughs> which, of course, he does talk about in the three races, as we'll see when we come back to the question of race and systemic racism. But um, um, it's true that um, American middle class society has a dullness, a monotonous. Uh, everyone's really wanting the same things. Yes, there are some people who have a taste for uh, who, I don't know, who want to like turn themselves into animals through implants and this kind of stuff. Uh, people have weird tastes. They want to like go to the mountains and 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 you know moon bathe in the moonlight in the nude or something like that but what he's saying is that in the heart of american society is a kind of monotony of middle class values and and tastes and expectations um and and again there are differences of wealth but they are not fundamental though there are some very wealthy people in america again who, who kind of verge to the super rich but in some ways most Americans would think of their houses as smaller and cheaper versions of the house that Bill Gates lives in or that uh, John Kerry lives in uh, or uh, or that um, uh, the Biltmore estate or something. There is there. And of course, there are poor Americans, but the vast uh, number of Americans are exactly as de Tocqueville describes them here. Um, in peaceful and well-ordered democracy, such as that of the United States, this is again is the middle of page 615. Um, where neither war nor public employment nor political confiscations opened the door to wealth as they did in the French, Russian, Chinese revolutions, and, and perhaps the, the centralized welfare state will become more confiscatory. Um, um, love of money chiefly turns men to industry. Americans work hard. And by the way, even today, I will say this, uh, the Japanese probably and maybe the Chinese work a little harder than we do, but most Europeans, this is quite true, like the French, for instance, take off the entire month of August for vacation. La, les vacances. Um, Americans work harder and mar more than almost any other industrialized, post-industrialized people in the world. So there is some still, some description to this. Description to this. Um, when de Tocqueville talks about industry, he doesn't mean like um, uh, uh, like the industrial revolution. He means the uh, um, uh, industrious habits of the everyday American. That's what he means. Now, though industry often brings in its train great disorders and great disasters, it cannot properly withhold exceedingly regular habits in the performance of a long succession of small uniform motions. Um, so, in some ways, as society becomes more prosperous and wealthy, uh, uh, this taste, this continuous agitation for material comfort and pleasure will become the dominant mood and passion of Americans. And, and turn to page 631. Um, I think I did assign this chapter, chapter 19, why there are so many men of ambition in the United States, but so few lofty ambitions. And on page um, 631, the pettiness of democratic middle-class ambition. A multitude, um, a multitude of petty, very reasonable desires from which occasionally a few higher and ill-controlled ambitions will break out such is the usual state of affairs in democratic nations. In them one hardly ever finds ambition which is proportionate, moderate, and yet vast. Did Bill Gates start out in his lower middle class life thinking that he would become, at one point, I think he's been exceeded by um, Bezos, the wealthiest man in the world? Probably not. And most Americans don't, unless they think of winning the lottery, most Americans don't think of, that, of themselves that they're going to eventually uh, have as much wealth as Oprah Winfrey or Queen Elizabeth II or Jeff Bezos or or um, or the Zuckerberg, um, but they still think they'll get wealthier, and they don't hate the wealth in that the wealthy in that sense. Um, these instincts of different origin mingle with ambition and takes its color from them. I think that ambitious men in democracies are less concerned than those in any other lands for the interests and judgments of posterity less concerned. The actual moment completely co occupies and absorbs them. They carry through great undertakings quickly in preference to erecting long-lasting monuments. They are much more in love with success than with glory. <laughs> There's a beautiful phrase, a, a typical beautiful de Tocquevillean analytic phrase. Um, when they ask from men is obedience. What they desire most is power. Um, 
Their manners are almost always lag behind the rise in social position. As a result, very vulgar tastes often go with their enjoyment of extraordinary prosperity. And it would seem that their only object as rising to supreme power was to gratify trivial and coarse appetites more easily. Um, so, as modern uh, uh, society becomes more scientifically capable, the goods of this world become more available to more of the masses. And the, t the material tastes and spiritual expand and spiritual uh, needs and inclinations decline. Um, uh, are, 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 will, will want more. And because the simplicity of democratic manners and the homogeneity make us able to imagine a kind of common humanity, as opposed to what? What was the nature of the human imagination in aristocratic societies? And here, let me, I have to share with you this great passage. I, again, I don't think I required this in the formal readings, but I'll refer you to the passage. This is actually from chapter one of volume two, part uh, uh, three. I may have assigned this chapter. I'm not sure, but I'm going to quote from it. The title of it is How Moors Become More Gentle as Social Conditions Become More Equal. Here's his basic point. In an aristocracy, we have two classes, permanent classes. A tiny, wealthy, dominant uh, a class that has all the expectations of permanent wealth and social position, and a huge uh, unchangeable mass of people confined to absolute poverty and and religious piety. By the way, um, what you there's you could say, well, aren't they both human beings? Aren't they belong to the same species? And de Tocqueville, this this goes back to my point that de Tocqueville is the great political psychologist of concepts in in society, which is why he straddles the distinction between political scientists and um, and sociologists. No, it turns out that you actually have two sp subspecies of human beings in societies like that. And oftentimes, even though they kind of have a dim awareness that they're human beings on either side of the class divide, in reality, they don't really quite see the other class as human beings. And, and here's this wonderful example um, of, of an, this aristocratic woman and, and de Tofa's description of it. And, and, and let me make sure you don't lose the, the larger point here. As conditions become more equal, and as people rise and fall, and social classes are, are, are muddled, then a kind of a general imagination of the human being as human being does take over society. And, of course, that's partially, which, we, which feeds the democratic imagination. It's like that uh, song, We Are the World, um, a couple of years ago. Um, and um, in other words, you can a kind of a and this, by the way, also connects with uh, volume two, part one. The democratic imagination imagines his humanity and imagines themselves as a part of this giant amalgamated humanity. But it's the abolition of social classes that unleash, unleashes the day to day ability to imagine other human beings as human beings like you. So uh, look at the alternative example from the aristocratic past. On the bottom of six, 562 and the top of 563. In the year 1675, the lower classes in Brittany, which is northern France, broke into revolt because of a new tax. These disturbances were put down with unexampled severity. This is how Madame de Sévigny, a witness of these horrors, tells her daughter about them in, in a chatty little familial letter. Au rocher, le, le troisième, uh, le, le uh, wait, 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 20, 30, uh, uh, le 30, le 30 octobre 1675. Um, uh, Quote, my word, dear daughter, how amusing your letter from A's is. At least read them over again before you send your letters. Let yourself be surprised. You could have written this to your daughter, your mother, this kind of chatty letter. People don't write letters anymore, but that's a different thing. Let yourself be surprised by how delightful they are and console yourself that your pleasure for the trouble of writing so many. So you have kissed the whole of Provence. There would be no pleasure in kissing the whole of Brittany unless one liked the smell of wine. Do you want to hear the news from Rennes? A tax of 100,000 crowns has been imposed on the citizens. And if that sum is not found within 24 hours, it will be doubled and collected by the soldiers. 
They have chased everyone out and banished them from the whole main street and forbidden anyone to receive them on pain of death. So one saw all these wretched people, women near their time, old men and, uh, uh, and children wandering in tears out of the town, uh, not knowing um, where to go without food, without bedding. The day before yesterday, they broke on the wheel, the rack, by the way, is what that means. The um, fiddler who started the dance and the stealing of stamped paper, he was quartered. You understand what that means, don't you? You saw, uh, what was that Mel Gibson movie um, uh, about the Scottish rebel? This is what it means to be 68 years old and see now. Um, uh, and he's captured by the British and executed. And the British still use this method of execution up to the 1800s, as did the French. Uh, actually, the French replaced it with the guillotine. Hanging, drawing, and quartering. Um, Braveheart, or Wildheart. The Braveheart, that was the Mel Gibson movie. Do you remember how he's executed? Hanging, drawing, and quartering. That means they hanged you almost to the point of death. Then they brought you down and then drew you open by opening your abdominal cavity and pulling out your guts. And then, while you were still alive, they would attach you to four horses and rip you apart, quarter you. That's what she's describing here. And his limbs exposed at the four corners of the town. They have taken 60 townsmen and will start hanging them tomorrow. This Provence it, province is a good example to the others, teaching them especially to respect the governors and their wives and never to throw stones into their gardens. Madame de Tarant was here in Barbara. In another letter, she adds, unquote, by the way, and then it adds further on the page of 563. Oh, uh, to her daughter, you talk cheerily about our miseries. We are not so broken on the wheel now. One a week to keep it justice going. It is true that hanging now seems quite a treat. I have gotten a new idea of justice since I've been part of this country. Your galley slaves seem to me a society worthy folk who have retired from the world to lead a quiet existence. Now, this is de Tocqueville's, unquote, this is de Tocqueville's commentary on this, to us, seems monstrous. Uh, de Tocqueville, on the bottom of 563, top of 564, it would be a mistake to suppose that Madame de Sévigné, who wrote these lines, was a selfish and barbarous person. She was passionately fond of her children and uh, showed herself very sensitive to the sorrows of her friends. And one can even notice in reading her letters that she treated her vassals and servants <coughs> with kindness and indulgence. But Madame de Savigny could not conceive clearly what it was like to suffer if one was not of noble birth. So in a, permanent, in a society of permanent classes, the human imagination is shaped by the class... You are born, raised, and will die in. But in a democratic society, which starts, by the way, with the conceptual premise of human equality uh, and the idea of rights, and then actually creates a society where the actual experience of daily life is imaginable and applicable to the human beings around you, then, in some ways, the gentleness of matters. And by the way, I would even say this. De Tocqueville discusses this in several places. I didn't have it. But it even starts to extend to animals. Um, think of how the humane treatment of animals, listen to that, by the way, the contradiction in that sentence, the humane treatment of animals, the American society, of the, you know, the way that animals were treated both in America and throughout the world, it would, it would shock you. You get in jail for the way you treated dogs and cats and horses, uh, the vast majority. Why is it that humanity went through this sea change uh, that is like uh, radicalized in PETA, the people for the ethical treatment of animals? It's because in some ways, this, the con concept of rights and the generality of human experience, which first extends to the human race, even extends to animals to some degree. So de Tocqueville really has got us down. Um, and, um, and when you add to that also these, the mildness, simplicity, the material taste for scientific and, and comfort, uh, and the unfolding of enlightenment, progress, secularism, and the need for heaven, um, on page 543, um, uh, uh, this is chapter 15, and I think I did assign this, how religious beliefs at times turn the thoughts of Americans towards spiritual things. Uh, page 543, if I had been born in an aristocratic age, where when both the hereditary wealth of some and the irremediable poverty of others diverted men from the thought of bettering their lot, 
and held them in a state of torpor, torpor fixed on the contemplation of another world i should be glad to wake such a people to the sense of its needs i should want to find the quickest and easiest means of satisfying those newly awakened longings and directing the best efforts of the best brains into physical studies scientific studies he means i should try to send them hunting for prosperity and american and modern society has uh, uh harnessed science still one of the disciplines in the academic world and the, and the liberal arts that still has some credibility um and uh because everybody kind of understands on a gut level that all our wealth and enjoyment of the, of the goods of this world are dependent upon scientific mastery of the laws of nature and therefore religion itself starts to fade legislators for democratic peoples democracies have other cares that's you guys by the way if you give democratic peoples education and freedom and leave them alone they will easily extract from this world all the good things it has to offer they will improve all useful techniques and make life daily more comfortable smooth and bland since their social condition by its nature urges them this way there is no need to fear they will stop but when man takes delight in this proper and legitimate quest for prosperity there is a danger that in the end he may lose the use of his sublimest faculties and that being bent on improving everything around him he may at length degrade himself that and nothing else is the peril if you've read brave new world by Aldo Suxley, the scientific dystopia of the authoritarian centralized future where the masses of people are shaped genetically and chemically and 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 in some ways uh, uh, trained like animals why for their own comfort and security you have to treat people like animals with respect to training and 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 ruling them so that they have a comfortable life the truth was saw it right there um uh, so when you add to that the third chunk and then last d on the notes the the last major element in the rise of the new despotism the end point probable end point of humanity and the centralized welfare state um is the administrative and political governmental centralization um and on page 675 is where he describes uh, the nature of this process and why it is that democratic societies prefer to turn more of social and personal life over to governmental administration and at the same time not only will more of social and economic functions be provided and performed by government but they will be centralized and therefore all authority in society will tend to the co concentration of that central center because people will want it and, ex and expect it and why chapter four in part four under uh, the centralization of government concerning peculiar and accidental causes which um, uh, 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 either lead a democratic people to complete the centralization of government or divert them from it. On page 675, I have, I have said that among democratic nations, the only form of government which comes naturally to mind is a sole and central power, and that they are not familiar with the notion of intermediate powers, except in America, which, because of the, the confederal origins of the country, kept some amount even in the constitution uh, that little whiff of anti-federalism that storing points out did contribute to the constitutional order but the constitution's central government and, and national government does eventually point in the direction of administrative centralization um that they are not familiar with the notion of meaning of powers this applies particularly to those democratic nations which have seen the principle of equality triumph with the help of a violent revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. The classes that managed local affairs were suddenly swept away in that storm, and as the confused mass which remains has not yet the organization or the habits that would allow it to take administration of these affairs in hand, the state alone seems capable of taking upon itself all the details of government. Centralization becomes a fact and, in a sense, a necessity. And and so how is that connected with the, the gradual evolution of the democratic imagination? Because the idea of rights, which tells us that we're free and equal, and as Dutolfo points out in the psychology of Democrat, democratic humanity, more equal, a passionate uh, attachment to equality. And they will want the government uh, to make everyone equal because that other kind of democratic passion, 
not the healthy independence in which I'm glad for the life I have and the freedom to live it the way I want, but rather uh, that envious uh, egalitarian uh, love of quote-unquote equity will make each democratic sen sen uh, 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 citizen resent that other ha people have more than they and will want the government to level them out of democratic envy and to secure in a predictable, uniform, uh, fair sense uh, that the goods of society are administered and provided to everybody. They will want the concept of equality to have substantive meaning so that no human being should have a better life than anybody else and they will turn to the central power to guarantee it. That is what de Tocqueville is describing. And finally, the conclusion of this, the new despotism uh, in uh, volume two, part four, um, uh, starting in this love of equality as fairness or fairness as equality or equity, um, uh, and the industrialization collapse of government into the centralized welfare state where the middle classes will finally become weary of the insecurities of the free market and, and it, providing for themselves, uh, you will eventually create uh, what the Tocqueville uh, calls the new despotism. So look in part volume 2, part 4, uh, page 691 to 692. This is where American democracy is probably headed and probably the end point for humanity. Taking into consideration, at the bottom of uh, 691, the trivial passions of men now, the softness of their mores, the extent of their education, the purity of their religion, their steady habits of patient work, and the restraint which they show in the indulgence of both their vices and their virtues, I do not expect their leaders to be tyrants, but rather schoolmasters. Thus, I think the type of oppression which threatens democracy is different from anything that has ever been in the world before. Our contemporaries uh, will find no prototype of it in their memories. I myself have vainly searched for a wor word which will exactly express the whole of the conception I have formed. Such old words as despotism and tyranny do not fit. The thing is new, and as I cannot find a word for it, I must try to define it. I am trying to imagine under what novel features despotism may appear again in the world. In the first place, I see an innumerable multitude of men, alike and equal, constantly circling around in pursuit of the petty and banal pleasures with which they glut their souls. Each one of them withdrawn into himself the individualism that he chronicled in uh, volume 1, Part 2, Chapters 2 through 5. Um, again, I would argue he's right about this and that the internet, social media, television has increased this atomization and individualization of the human race so that even though you can imagine this kind of global humanity, your own life has contracted to this uh, a little bit of your own universe. Each one of them withdrawn into himself is almost unaware of the fate of the rest. Mankind for him consists in his children and his personal friends. Friends. As for the rest of his fellow citizens, they are near enough, but he does not notice them. He touches them, but feels nothing. He exists in and out of for himself, and though he may still have a family, one can at least say that he has not got a fatherland. Over this kind of men stands an immense protective power, which is alone responsible for securing their enjoyment and watching over their fate. That power is absolute, thoughtful of detail, orderly, provident, and gentle. It would resume parental authority if, father-like, it tried to prepare its charges for a man's life. But on the contrary, it only wants to keep them in perpetual childhood. It likes to see its citizens enjoy themselves, provided they think of nothing but enjoyment. It gladly works for their happiness, but wants to be the sole agent and judge of it. It provides for their security, foresees and supplies their necessities, facilitates their pleasures, manages their principal concerns, directs their industry, makes rules for their testaments, and divides up their inheritances. Why should it not entirely relieve them for the trouble of thinking and all the care of living? This is a pretty grim prospect for the future of humanity. And um, in the 
uh, opening decades of the 21st century, this does seem to path that we are walking down. So I must say, uh, Nietzsche predicted this, the last man. Uh, Cropsey raises this possibility that as we move further and further towards the centralized welfare state, humanity will become so immersed in the physical and daily pleasures of life that we'll lose interest even in our own communities. So um, I have one reflection on this, and then I'll end this module. Um, could Nietzsche, de Tocqueville, uh, Aldous Huxley be right? that the conclusion of the modern age will be a kind of an evaporation of personal liberty and a collapse into the centralized power of the provident and generous welfare state, um, where Marx imagines a universal uh, agglomeration of courageous workers, where in reality, it may seem as if we're moving to the common trough, where we all become pigs satiating our little material lives. Um, at least as long as they're secure, equally uh, uh, supplied, and everyone has a little bit of something. What does it depend on, the future of humanity? It may depend, if the Tocqueville's and Nietzsche's for that matter, and even uh, Huxley's grim future, depends probably on the extent to which human beings can interestingly enough hold on to some kind of token of spirituality at the heart of their identity. And that makes us wonder what are the possible basis of political culture and moral identity and personal integrity now and in the evolving centuries it seems to me there are only four god the divine supernatural high and low revelation where you see every human being possessing a spark of the divine uh, even unborn humans uh, and even old humans old fat humans that there's some kind of element because of the human identity has a divine framework in which the material needs of the world don't exhaust human identity. The second one is the noble, the beautiful. Uh, and there's a, both a, a secular version of this and a high and low version of this. When I teach ancient political philosophy, this is what I think the vision of Plato, Aristotle, and Cicero is. That somehow, uh, not not because the, the uh, Platonic and the Aristotelian and the Ciceronian vision of political humanity doesn't rest upon the gods or the gods, even though in Plato's Republic and in the laws, there's talk of the gods. I think what Aristotle was trying to do in the ethics and the politics, for instance, was even for the common man to hold up a notion of personal honor and nobility that you could, you see your identity as resisting the descent into animality. Converse College, soon to be Converse University, um, has a bit of this in the honor tradition. The idea is you don't cheat, and, and which, remember, is a combination of stealing and lying. You don't cheat, because not because you'll get caught. Um, that's self-interest rightly understood, by the way. Or because um, it's the violation of the Sixth and Eighth Commandments, or Sixth and Seventh Commandments. But because you feel yourself debased and turned into an animal. That's the second possibility for human identity. The third one, self-interest, a kind of a natural grasp, long-range and complicated of your, of your interest. That's Hobbes, Locke, the market, Adam Smith. And remember, that's what the Tocqueville holds out as the last hope uh, for humanity, that perhaps you can teach the masses to appreciate and to have some kind of independence and self-will based upon a rational grasp of their long-range and complicated interest. Better that humanity should be a nation of industrious business people um, uh, who at least know how to save and invest, work hard, and plan for the future, as opposed to a bunch of craven and egalitarian um, uh, uh, res resentment, where uh, they live for the day and, and, uh, and, and, and primarily experience envy at people that have a better life than them. The last available uh, source of self and public and, and private culture, you'd have to say is Nietzschean, the will, the self. And uh, even though in the last iteration of uh, modern political philosophy, I didn't get to Nietzsche and the existentialism. This is existentialism, where the world is self-creation, self-indulgence. But the problem is, if you follow Cropsey's argument, where the great modern the movements in modern political philosophy, as they become popularized and filtered down, they become vulgarized. So this last alternative, which, which is kind of the basis of popular culture now, do your own thing. Um, you can't legislate morality because you have to create your own little private uh, 
uh, and um, uh, and uh, you have to create your own private world of morality and your own self world. It's not clear that this has the resources to prevent the descent into the grim uh, vision that de Tocqueville sees. So it may turn out that the future of humanity depends upon human beings see themselves in the cosmos as individuals. And how they see themselves is either a spark of God, the possession of a noble identity, rational self-interest, perhaps even democratized will. Um, that will demand the conditions as to how they, and, and color the conditions they want from themselves and how they live themselves and see their own lives and also what they believe they owe to and demand from society and government. And these four possible sources of personal identity may determine which version of equality, the healthy, independent, uh, self-reliant kind, or the envious, egalitarian, uh, centralized kind comes to dominate not only the personal lives of humanity, but the collective political life of the coming generations.